this afternoon what we're going to talk about is some sewage and effluent containers electrical and fields how does it all fit together that's the subtitle there and of course sometimes people say well why do I need to know about this why do I need to know about that and the point is when you're trying to pick a pump for the job you got to make sure you've got the right pump so you've got to have the right knowledge to know that you've got the right pump okay now we're going to get going here this is a sump pump this is a utility pump the difference between a sump pump and a utility pump a sump pump is automatic a utility pump is manual so in other words if you want to uh, do something with that utility pump and turn it on you have to turn it off too okay there's an effluent pump an effluent pump pumps effluent water it's got three quarter inch legs this is another type of effluent pump it does not pump three quarter inch solids uh, but what's interesting about it is that it draws off the bottom so you don't have to have quite such a deep pit to put it in that's a sewage pump there uh, waste handler actually and waste handler pumps uh, we sell up through five horsepower and they're used for lift station applications here's a lift out guide rail system and there's a couple more lift out guide rail systems what we want to talk about here we want to talk about containers we want to talk about electrical uh, we want to talk about different fields and so what we've got here to start out with is a simplex system now notice it says a typical simplex system and I'm going to tell you that because of those legs I suspect this is a sewage system now another reason that I suspect it's a sewage system is because of that check valve you'll notice the check valve is in the horizontal position and we're going to strongly encourage you to always put the check valve in a horizontal position when you are using a sewage application remember a sewage pump can handle two inch solids and you don't want a two inch solid to come down and settle on your check valve in a vertical position because then it wouldn't open up again you'd have a deadhead application but by putting that uh, check valve in the horizontal if something happens a pump shuts off and there's something coming up towards it it'll either float back down or sit in the pipe and wait for it to turn on again next time but at least the check valve will open then if the solid is sitting on top of the check valve it can't open we're going to recommend also that you put in a gate valve now this has to be a gate valve that opens all the way up because you don't want to restrict the uh, size of that opening and it's going to have one of two positions either all the way open so the system can work the way the system is supposed to automatically or all the way closed because I'm working on the system because something failed all right now the purpose for the gate valve is simply the fact that there may be a lot of pipe between you and say for example a curb stop all right and of course you don't want all the water that's in that pipe to come back down at you the check valve is holding that water in the pipe of course if I'm going to disconnect the pump and the check valve all that water is going to want to come back close the valve down close the valve down and now you keep all that water in the pipe the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to open up this union here and when you do the only water you have to deal with is the water between the check valve and the gate valve so the shorter distance you can keep there the less water you have to deal with now there is an eighth inch hole and it's drilled one to two inches above the discharge what's the purpose of that hole it's so that we can evacuate the air out of the pump and allow the pump to fill up with water the the problem with a with a uh, sewage system is quite often the water over the pump isn't very much and because there's not a lot of water over the pump if you've got a check valve in that line and that check valve is close enough to the pump what happens is you have to compress the air inside the pump to get water into it so if you can't compress the air then you can't get water in and you airlock the pump by putting that eighth inch hole two inches above the discharge what winds up happening is as the as the water comes into the basin and starts to fill it up you now allow that air to escape so it can continue to fill that pump up with water and now the pump is primed 
Remember, if the pump's not primed, we call it a fan. Okay? So there's your eighth inch hole right there. Again, it's one to two inches above the discharge. Now, there is a two inch hole in the bottom since this is a sewage pump. There'll be a two inch hole in the bottom of it. And of course, that two inch hole in the bottom is to allow uh, your water and your materials to pass up through there. Okay? They have to be spherical. All right? So we're talking a spherical solid. And they'll get pushed right out through the discharge then. We need to fill this whole area here with water, and that's why that little hole is there, to allow us to get the water in there. All right? Now, you'll notice we've got a uh, inlet, and we've got a vent. The vent, there's only going to be one vent, and that vent is to get rid of any gases that are in there. The vent has to go all the way up through the building and out through the roof. You don't want those gases uh, collecting in the building because somebody could very easily get killed because of that. So you want to make sure that you vent it all the way up and out. All right. Now, when we talk about a basin, we use the diameter and the depth. So we might say something like uh, 36 by 60. 36 by 60 simply means that it's 36 inches wide, 60 inches deep. All right. So typically, we give the diameter and then we give the depth of the basin. Now, we've got a question here for you, another question here for you. We like to see a minimum of a one-minute run time. So the usable water storage area is where in the basin? And this is a toughie, okay? The thing you have to remember is this. That's the off line right there so when that float gets down to that line the pump turns off now of course what that means is all the water that's under there is always going to be there that water's never going to go away all right so because that water doesn't go away that's not usable water all right the other thing to remember is you don't want water going up through the inlet so because you don't want water going up through the inlet anything from the inlet up that's all non-usable area okay that's gases and air you don't want water up there that would be bad okay now of course what does it leave it leaves this area right here the area between the off switch and the inlet the bottom of the inlet that's your usable water area so when you try to calculate how much usable water you need that's the area that you have to concentrate on. That bottom, I, I usually say the bottom foot, it might only be 8 to 10 inches, but I usually say the bottom foot of the basin is always going to be full of water. So from that one foot up to the inlet, that's your usable water space. This is a typical duplex system. Duplex means I'm putting in two pumps. Now a simplex system is more than likely going to be an automatic system. You can use a panel with it if you'd like, but most people just put in a, an automatic pump, and then they'll also throw in a, a float for an alarm just in case they need the alarm. Okay. When you have a duplex system, you must use a panel. You cannot use two automatic pumps. And the reason you can't is because unless you've got them set up properly, and nobody can set them up properly, uh, what's going to happen is one pump is going to be used all the time. The other pump isn't going to get used until the first pump dies. And, of course, by the time the first pump dies, what winds up happening is all this crud and stuff builds up over the top of the second pump. It turns on, and it can't get water. So the bottom line is you have to have a panel because what a panel has in it is called an alternator. And the alternator will alternate back and forth between pumps. So pump one will be the, uh, the lead pump the first time. And then the second time pumps get used, pump two will be the lead pump. All right. So you've got two pumps in here, pump one and pump two. Remember, you're going to have to put a... Uh, priming hole in each one of those discharge pipes 
So you don't just put one in. You got to put one in each pump. You've got two discharges now. They could go up through the uh, uh, top of the basin, or they could go out through the side of the basin. That's up to you. All right. Um, you're going to have one vent. Even though you've got two pumps, you've only got one vent because you've got one basin here. You can have several inlets. Okay. Uh, I knew a system one time that had 27 homes on it. And of those 27 homes, they were connected. All 27 homes were connected to six inlets. So there were six inlets into that basin. And 27 homes coming into it. Okay. So you can have as many inlets as you need. There is going to be a grommet that goes around each one of the pipes that come out through the lid. There will also be grommets for uh, any wiring coming up through the lid. You got to keep all those gases in the lid. That uh, cord right there is your plug-in for your pump. All right, there's one over here for this pump. Then there is a cord for your floats. So each float's going to have a cord. Now you'll notice those floats are connected to what is called a float tree. The float tree is connected to the top of the basin. And of course, you're going to apply your three floats to your float tree. Uh, there is an alternate way of doing that. and We'll talk about it later on in the presentation. All right. Remember, you have an off float, which means everything below that line is always going to be full of water. Okay, you've got your bottom of your basin uh, inlets there, and so of course you can see you've got some area between those basins. Now, we recommend a three float system. There's a very important reason why we recommend the three float system, and it's simply this. Your bottom float is going to be your off float. The next float up is going to be your on float. And then the third float, the top float, is going to be your lag pump alarm. And that's the way we would like to see a duplex system set up. All right. Now, the reason for that is because there are engineers out there who prefer what is called a four float system. I happen to uh, have gone down to one of our um, repping agencies one time down in Atlanta and they are not just repping agents but they're also uh, engineers and they said they always size a four float system. When I was done they kind of changed their mind. Now, let me explain why uh, here. Okay. So your bottom float is still going to be your off float, and the next float up is still going to be your on float. What engineers want is they want the next float up to be the lag pump and the fourth or top float to be the alarm. Now, of course, I explained to them why I did not like this system. And the reason I don't like the system is simply this. Pump 1 is my lead pump, pump 2 is my lag pump. So the first time the system turns on, pump 1 turns on, and of course, pump 2 only comes on if there's an emergency. Okay, so the system comes up, it turns on. Once it turns on, it comes down and turns off. And the uh, in, in the panel, there is that alternator, and it alternates the lead pump and the lag pump. Now what winds up happening is the next time the system turns on, pump 2 is the lead pump. And it comes down and it turns off. Okay, and then of course we alternate again. Now we keep doing that and then eventually one of the pumps is going to die. Okay, so now my lead pump, uh, my, my float comes up, my on float comes up, water goes right past the on float to the lag pump. The lag pump turns on, pumps the system down, and everything seems to be just fine. Remember, I've got an alternator. It alternates, so the next time the pump goes, uh, the water comes up, and it hits that on float and comes back down, and once again, they alternate. Now, here's where the problem comes in. What if pump two dies? Now what happens, the water goes all the way up to the alarm, 
and the guy in charge has a problem. Okay? It's that simple. The guy in charge has a problem. It's not the engineer. The engineer doesn't have a problem because he signed off on it. Okay? So now whoever took the system over, it's their problem. So, I, um, I want to make sure that you understand here why I like a three-float system. Because with a three-float system, when the lag pump comes on, the alarm lets me know the lag pump comes on. Now, here's the thing that I'm going to tell you is that the engineers want the lag pump as the third one and the alarm as the fourth one because when they size these systems up, quite often they're not 100% sure that they've got it exactly right. So if they put the lag pump second, now the lag pump is there for two reasons. The first reason is if one of the pumps dies, the other pump is there and it is, it's going to turn on. Okay. The main reason the lag pump is there, though, is if I sized it wrong and it needs two pumps to empty the basin out, then when the water gets high enough, it'll turn that second pump on and I can empty the basin out. So if I make a little mistake, big deal. Of course, their problem is if the alarm comes off, everybody knows they made the mistake. So they want that alarm as the fourth uh, float so that, that way nobody knows that they made a mistake. So my thought is this, if you do run across one of these engineers who absolutely is not going to listen to reason, is not going to let you put a three float system in, absolutely insists that you have a four float system, he's not going to sign off unless you do it this way. But guess what? Once he signs off, it's your system. What do you do? Change those two around. Now, I'd probably put the lag pump float a little closer to the alarm float so that one would take off after the other. That way the alarm float would go off uh, when the water table got low enough. All right. So the bottom line is, yes, there may be times that, I mean, I don't blame the engineers. I understand their reasoning for doing it. But I'm just telling you that I had a guy in class one time come up to me and he said, you know, he says, I check those systems every month. Every month I'm out there and check that system. I'm not worried about a four float system. And I said, well, what happens if a week after you check the system, pump one dies? He said, well, that's okay. I still got pump two. I said, okay. So what happens if two weeks after pump two, one dies, pump two dies? You checked it every month, but what good did it do you if both pumps died during one month? And so the point is, I would rather have the annoyance of the alarm going off and knowing that the pump came on than to not know that there's a dead pump and wind up with two dead pumps because now I got an emergency. So on this next slide here, we're going to talk about a, uh, a basin. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you that a basin is quite often used where there is an afterthought. In other words, I wasn't planning on putting something here, but now I'll give you an example of it. My uh, my brother-in-law, he uh, when he got married, he bought a little house, uh, a cottage like, on uh, a lake, and he was on a hill. And so it allowed him to put in what they call a walkout. So he had a walkout basement, meaning he had three basement walls that were all the way up to the top. And, well, one side of the basement didn't have a basement wall at all. There was a wall there, but it wasn't a basement wall. It wasn't covered with dirt. It allowed him to walk right out, built a patio there, and they had a nice party spot. Okay? Of course, over time, they wound up having a baby girl, and they were so excited of course, now there's only one bathroom and two bedrooms, but that's okay. They've only got themselves and the baby girl. Of course, when the baby girl was eight years old, guess what? She got a baby sister. Oh, she was so excited to have her baby sister. Of course, by the time her baby sister was eight and she was 16, she wasn't so excited about her baby sister anymore. As a matter of fact, she told her father she'd like to have a room of her own. 
So dad says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll put a, a, be a bedroom for you downstairs in the basement, and then what I'll do is I'm going to put in a bathroom down there too. So he puts a bathroom downstairs too. Now, of course, the problem that he has is that the septic tank is in the front yard, which faces the opposite side of the lake. And because it is, the lines of the septic go out about halfway up that, that wall. So now he's got to get his shower, his toilet, and his sink water up to that point. So he knocks a hole in the, in the basement floor, puts a basin in, connects all those systems to the basin, and then takes the basin up and connects it to the septic system. And that's what a basin is for. Now, it's like I say, it's an afterthought. So there's going to be an inlet coming in. There'll be a discharge pipe. And, of course, you got your pump in there. You're going to have to have a vent. And remember, that vent's going to have to go all the way up to the roof and out through the roof so you can vent out through the roof. You don't want any of that poisonous gas getting in the house. All right. There will be a gasket that goes around the lid as well as grommets for all of the stuff to come up through the lid. Okay, It'll more than likely be an automatic system, meaning that you're going to plug the pump into the wall, or well, if it's piggyback, you'll plug the, the float switch into the wall, and then you'll plug the pump switch into the, into the uh, float, so that you have an automatic system. Automatic means that when the float goes up, it turns on. When the float goes down, it turns off. Okay? You're going to have a sewage system here because you've got a toilet connected to it. So because it is a sewage system, you need a minimum velocity of 2 feet per second. Pipe sizing and pump sizing become extremely important, as well as basin sizing. But basin sizing is very important because if you don't have that basin sized properly, you're not going to get a whole lot of runtime on that pump. All right? Now, this is called a vault. And I want you to know you can see this vault is a two chamber vault. I was up in Canada one time doing this presentation, and they said, Oh, two chamber vaults aren't allowed up here. That's against the law. I said, Okay. You see where that wall is that separates the two chambers? Yeah. Pretend there's a foot of dirt between them. And you got two separate chambers. Okay? We can solve that problem. Now, a vault quite often is also called a septic tank. When they make septic tanks, they have a few inlets or a few holes in them around the side of the tank. And they also have a hole or two on the top of the tank. All right? The holes on the side, one is going to be the inlet, one is going to be the outlet. Okay, now sometimes they may put more than one outlet in there. And then, of course, the hole on the top is so that you can get into it and work in there if you need to. Now, I'm going to tell you that I was at a place one time where they made these tanks. I watched them make them, and I also watched to see that they have to test each and every one of those tanks. And each and every one of those tanks, if they don't pass that test, they have to throw it out. Okay? The test is a test where they put a vacuum. They put a vacuum pump on one of those holes. So they plug the other holes, they put a vacuum on that, and then they draw a vacuum on it. And the vacuum has to hold for 24 hours. So that... Once that tank gets made, they go ahead and they test it to make sure that the vacuum is going to hold. All right? That's because they don't want anything leaking out of that tank. So one side is called a septic tank. The other side is called a pump chamber. Again, you can have two separate chambers if you have to, and you can't use a two-chamber uh, vault. That's okay. Then use two different vaults. One will be the septic tank. One will be the pump chamber. All right? On the septic tank, that's where your inlet is. So your, your water coming from your house are, is going to come out and go into that septic tank. Now you will notice that one way or another, that water is going to get knocked down right as it enters. Right as it enters, it's going to get knocked down. They're going to put an elbow there. They're going to put a screen there. They're going to do something to cause that water to drop right straight down. And the reason for that is because... What's coming into this tank? A BOD count of over 300. 
So because the BOD count is so high, we want this water to slowly go across the tank. If you don't have that screen or that elbow in there, the water splashes halfway across the tank and you don't get the full use of the tank. So to get the full use of the tank, we knock that water down right away. Now what happens is this, a septic tank is an anaerobic system. Aerobic means to oxygenate, anaerobic means that we're going to allow good bacteria to kill off bad bacteria. So we're going to have good bacteria in this tank. And when that bad bacteria, that BOD count, biochemical oxygen demand, when that BOD count is that high on that incoming sewage, we're going to allow the good bacteria to attack it and break it down. Now, as it breaks down, a couple things are going to happen. Sludge is going to form on the bottom. Okay, That's your solid settling out. Your oils and your uh, soaps are going to float to the surface. They're going to become what's called scum. In between the scum and the sludge, you're going to get effluent water. Now remember, the particle size for effluent water is three quarters of an inch. That's the maximum particle size for effluent water. Okay. Now that effluent water is going to move through the baffle over into the pumping chamber. When it gets to the pumping chamber, what we're looking for is that BOD count to go from about 300 down to 10 to 20. When it leaves the pumping chamber, it goes out into the leach field, and at the leach field, we get rid of that last 10 to 20 BOD count through uh, a process um, that we call um, aerobic we're going to allow oxygen to get down into that ground and kill off the last that bad bacteria. All right? Now, something does happen as time goes on. All right? As time goes on, the sludge is going to build up and the scum will come down. As it does, that means the affluent area becomes smaller. Now, I got a question. As the sludge builds up and the area between the sludge and the scum becomes smaller, what's going to happen? According to Bernoulli's law, the smaller the area the water moves through, the faster the water moves. So, of course, what that means is if I don't pump this thing out often enough, what happens, my affluent area becomes smaller, and of course my BOD count going into the, the pump chamber now is going to go up. So that's why you have to make sure that you keep this thing pumped on a regular basis. Now, you can see the reason why. All right, A higher BOD count going into your leach field is going to cause the leach field to plug up and now you've got to put in a whole new field. So to make those fields last longer, keep the BOD count down. And how do you keep the BOD count down? Pump the septic tank in a reasonable amount of time. Now we get over into the pumping chamber and we've got effluent water now. There's no big particles, three quarters of an inch, that's it. Okay, We're going to have an effluent pump in here which means the feet are three quarters of an inch off the bottom, not two inches. The float tree with your three floats on it, on, off, an alarm. Okay. And then we're also going to have one elbow, two elbows, three elbows. Now you'll notice we don't just elbow and go right straight out. We bring that whole system up high enough to the junction box so that if I need to, I can reach my hand in there and I can undo that union and pull the pump out. Now, of course, it's on. It's, the floats are on a float tree, so if I pull the pump out, I'm only fixing the pump. If the pump is fine, I can reach in there, undo the float tree, and pull the floats out and not disturb the pump. That's the purpose of a float tree. Some people like to tape the floats right to the pipe, or the discharge pipe, but if you do that, if you want to re if you want to work on one, you have to also pull the other. 
Whereas if you have a flow tree and separate from your uh, pump discharge, you can take one off and leave the other one in. With the three elbows in there, you can just go ahead and loosen that union and pull the whole thing up. Now, here's where the problem comes in. If I don't have those three elbows in there, if I just have one elbow, I go up and I elbow and go right through the outlet. Now I have to get my head down in that uh, chamber. The EPA regulates that anybody putting their head in that chamber has to have some type of breathing apparatus on. All right, you cannot go into those chambers without a breathing apparatus. And so that's why if you bring that pipe up high enough, you can just reach in there without having a breathing apparatus. So it's very, very important that you have those three elbows in there. Okay. A union for the disconnect switch, very or union for the disconnect to make sure that you can disconnect it quickly. All right. Now, the next thing we're going to look at here, so that was that was looking at containers. Now we're going to look at electrical. Incoming into your house are going to be two 115 volt systems. If you were to take a voltmeter and put it between those two wires, you would read 230 volts. All right? Now, those two 115 volt wires are going to be connected to what they call bus bars. One is going to be a positive bus bar, one is going to be a negative bus bar. Okay? 115 volt doesn't care if it's positive or negative because it's not doing positive and negative. It's doing po it's doing ground. It's doing whatever it is to ground. Okay? When you have a 115 volt cable, there's actually three wires inside that cable. There's a white wire that's called neutral, there's a black wire that's called hot, and there is a, a ground wire. Uh, usually it's re uh, designated as green on a drawing, but it will probably be just a solid copper wire inside of the cable. All right. So what you do is you pull some of the cable um, insulation back, cut it off, throw it away, and you take portions of those three wires and connect them up. The black wire is going to get connected to the single throw, single pole breaker. Okay, now it's really important that you understand that a single pole, single throw breaker means you're doing 115 volt. Single pole means I'm only connected to one bus bar. Bus bars are also called poles. Took me a long time to learn that. Single throw, a throw is nothing more than a toggle switch. That's all it is. And it's either off or it's on, one or the other. Okay, that's it. So the bottom line is that what we're looking at here is we're hooking up to one of those bus bars. We're going to take that black wire connected to that breaker and we're going to bring it out and connect it uh, when we get out to where our plug-in is. We'll again cut our cable, we'll pull back some of the insulation on it, and we'll take some black wires and hook up to one side of the plug-in, and we'll take white wires and hook up to the other side of the plug-in. All right. Now the white wire is also going to go back to what they call the neutral bar, and the neutral bar is connected to the ground. In case of emergencies, what they do is they put a ground wire on each one of those plug-ins, and that ground wire comes right along with that wrapping, so it comes right inside of that cable, so that if anything happens to get nicked, it goes back to ground. Ground takes it back to the neutral bar, the neutral bar takes it to the ground. The ground could be the ground from the electric company, the ground could just be a grounding rod, either way. Okay? Now the bottom line is, I plug something in that, pl that plug in there, the electric comes in, it's coming in on that black bus bar, our breakers connect to the black bus bar, so our black wire hauls the electricity out to our plug-in, and the electricity is just waiting there. It wants to go to ground, and it can't because there's no place to go. So you plug something into it, it follows that plug-in right up to the switch. When you turn that switch on, the electricity goes through whatever it is, a light bulb, a computer, a speaker, a projector, whatever. 
it comes back onto that white wire, follows the white wire over to the neutral bar, and then from the neutral bar it follows out to the ground. And it goes to ground, because 115 volt wants to go to ground. And that's how 115 volt works. Okay? If I go and take a voltmeter and I go hot to ground, it should register 115 volts. Now remember, the electric company is allowed plus or minus 10%. So you can be plus or minus 10% of 115. Okay? 230 volts. You'll notice that we've got a little symbol up there that says don't do this. Okay? And of course what they're doing is they're putting two single pole breakers on a uh, 230 volt system. Remember what I said a minute ago, a single pole breaker means a 115 volt system. Two of them together, well, I got a call one time from a guy who said my son just graduated from electrical school and we've got a question for you. We've, we've, we're hooking up our pump 230 volts, but he can't remember what do you do with the common wires. And I said, common wires? Where, where are you getting common wires from? And he says, over, oh, crying out loud, you've got it, two 115 volt systems, and you hook them together, and that gives you 230 volts. Now, I'm not going to deny that that's true because I know it is true. But I also know another thing. You don't need six wires to run 230 volt. So I said to him, have your son take a wire nut and wire nut those common wires together. Then have him go back to school and learn how to hook up 230 volts properly because you don't need six wires for 230 volt. You only need three, two hots and a ground. Okay, now of course the other thing that it says here is don't use two single pole breakers and the reason for that is if one breaker trips, the other breaker is still hot. And if the pump demands electricity, that's not going to be good. Okay, so the bottom line is you should never use two single pole single throw breakers. If you go hot to ground, you will get 115. If you go hot to ground, you get 115. If you go hot to hot, you get 230. But the problem is, if one trips, the other's still hot. Whenever you're doing a 230 volt, a true 230 volt, you should be using what is called a double pole single throw breaker. Double pole single throw breaker simply means if I go hot to ground, I get 115. I go hot to ground, I get 115. When I go hot to hot, I get 230. But the good news is, it's a single throw. Now what that simply means then is with a single throw is that if something should happen, both sides get taken out at the same time. One side doesn't stay hot. So that's why you want to use a double pole single throw breaker on a 230 volt system. I had a guy call up one time and he says, Bill, I don't understand this. He said, I go hot to ground, I get 115. I go hot to ground, I get 115. But when I go hot to hot, I get zero. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that even possible? So I said, give me your name and number, I'll call you back. So I get his name and number. I go over and I talk to the electrical engineer and I tell him the situation. He says, well, more than likely what the guy's doing is he's using two 115 volt breakers and he's got them both in the same bus bar. Now you have to remember to have 230 volts, one's got to be positive, one's got to be negative. 115 volt doesn't care, but 230 volts, one has to be positive, one has to be negative. If both of them are positive, you're not going to get a reading. It's going to say zero because there's no movement. Okay, electricity's looking to move. You go to ground, it'll move. So you go to ground, you get registered 115. You go to ground with the other one, you get registered 115. But if they're both in the same bus bar and you go hot to hot, you'll get zero. So hot to ground, hot to ground, hot to hot. With an automatic pump, you have two cords. At least we hope you do anyway. All right, you got a power cord and you got a float cord. All right, the float cord is called piggyback. 
And the reason it's called piggyback is because you're going to plug one into the wall and then you're going to plug the other cord into that cord. So the way that it works here is we're going to plug the float cord into the wall and then we're going to plug the pump cord into the float. Now this one's plugging in on the side, some of them plug in from behind, whatever. Okay, they're kind of like Christmas tree lights. The bottom line is you've got to plug one into the other. Now, this is going to cause a problem when you go to do an ohmmeter test on a float. Because it isn't just a matter of, well, let's just plug, it, plug our two testers in here and lift the float up. No, it doesn't work that way. Because there's a break between the two plug-ins. Alright? Even the two plug-ins on the back side, there's a break in there. So you've got to make sure that you've got it done correctly okay and so when you're doing that ohmmeter test it isn't just grabbing a hold of those two plugs and doing it you got to actually go to where the other cord plugs in so you can get a complete circuit there all right now the next thing we want to point out is how that float works most floats sold today are going to be mechanical there are few, and I do mean very few, states that still allow mercury float. Most of them are going to insist on a mechanical type float nowadays. So this is a, a picture that I drew of a mechanical float that we have got here that's see-through. Okay, And if you look at it from one way, you can see that uh, you're looking at it from the back side. So you can see there's two connections there, one's white, one's black. And of course the bottom line is right now they're open. If you look at it from the side, you can see they're open. The ball is pushing down and forcing them open. All right. What happens is when the float goes all the way up, the ball moves in the other direction and pushes them closed. Now, as the water goes down, you can see the ball is going to start moving and once it gets back into this direction, it nails it the other direction and opens it back up and that turns the pump off so that's how your mechanical floats work what happens if my electrical source is further away than my the length of my cords what do I do now okay so what we have here is a junction box and we're going to show you how to wire this junction box up so that your pump works the way you want it to work. All right? You're going to have a green wire that comes from the source, and that green wire is going to connect to the green wire on your power cord for your pump. That's your ground. Okay? A float does not have a ground to it. You're going to take the black wire from your source to the black wire from your float cord. Then you're going to take the white wire from the float cord and connect it to the black wire on the pump cord. And lastly, you take the white wire from the pump and connect it to the white wire on the source. All right. And now you've got it connected so that when the electricity comes in, it's going to go through the float first. And then once the float moves in the up position, it will close and send the electricity up to the pump. Once the float comes down, it breaks the connection and stops the flow of electricity. All right. Now, this particular diagram is going to look exactly the same as the last one, but there's a reason why I'm putting it in there. All right? The reason I'm putting it in there is simply this. You've got the ground wires that go together. You've got the neutral wires that go together, the black wire from the source to the black wire on the float, and the white wire on the float to the black wire on the power cord. What's different about this one? It's a diaphragm switch. Now, why is that important? Because the diaphragm switch has to breathe. There is a tube that comes up with that float cord, and the bottom line is, if you crimp that tube, it now takes more pressure to close the float. So the bottom line is, you've got to be very, very careful when you have a diaphragm switch and you're using this type of a connection. You have to be real careful not to crimp or pinch off that vent tube that's in there. 
If you're going to use a terminal strip, that's the back side of a terminal strip. You've got one terminal connected to the other terminal. On the front side, it looks like this. Remember, you've got three cords. You've got a source, you've got a power cord to the pump, and you've got a float switch cord. So the ground wire from the power goes to the ground wire on the source. The white wire on the power goes to the white wire on the source. The black wire on the power goes to the black wire on the float. The white wire on the float goes to the black wire on the power. Okay, now you've got it wired correctly. This is a special type of float that we sell. It's called an ALC. You are looking at it from two different angles. You're looking at it, the picture on the right is from the bottom. You're looking at the bottom, you're looking up on the bottom. And of course, the picture on the left, you're looking at it from the side. Okay, so the common wire the one on the right hand side says common that's also where it says white 115 black 230 so it depends on if I'm running my pump 115 or 230 the switch doesn't really care one way or the other okay so I can hook up 115 or 230 now you'll notice it says normally open and on the right hand side that says pump down and then it says normally closed and the right hand side that says pump up Pump down means I'm working a septic system. Pump up means I am working a cistern. So when I have a cistern and I want to fill that cistern, I want to pump up. I want to fill the water up. When I have a septic tank, I want to pump down because I want to get that water out of that septic tank. So that's a pump down. So how do I hook my cords up? Well, if I'm running 115 or 230, the white wire is going to be on common. If it's 230, it's going to be one of the blacks. It doesn't matter which one. All right. Um, my black wire on my 115 and my other wire, my other black wire on my 230, is going to hook up to whether I want to do a pump down or a pump up. If again, if I'm running a septic system, I want to do pump down. If I'm running a uh, if I'm running a cistern, I want to do pump up. All right. Now the way the float simply works is this: there's two floats on here, and they're on a spring, and and they're connected to a plunger. The weight of the two uh, floats compress the spring and pull the plunger down. Now what happens is this: as the water comes up, you'll notice the floats get lighter, and as the floats get lighter, the spring starts to decompress. Once the spring decompresses all the way, it gets close enough, there's a magnet on each end there. There's a magnet on the end of the plunger. There's a magnet on the end of the clicker. Okay. When those magnets get pulled together, the clicker closes and makes the connection, turns the pump on. All right. As the water goes out, the weight of the floats gets heavier, compresses the spring once again, pulling the plunger down, and eventually disconnecting the magnets. Control panels. This is called a simplex control panel. Simplex means simple. You can get a circuit breaker built into the panel if you want. That's optional. But you definitely are going to get a motor contactor in there. Okay, so if you got the breaker box outside, that's one thing. If you want, you can put the breaker inside too. But you've got to have a motor contactor. So you're going to go from the breaker to the motor contactor. Okay, now there's going to be two terminal boards. One terminal board is going to be for the connection of the pump. The other terminal board is going to be for the connection of the floats. So there'll be two terminal boards in there. There's a wiring diagram telling you how to wire it. There is an alarm fuse indicator. There is a control fuse and indicator. There is a pump run light. Now you're only going to see the pump run light if you've got the cover open. That, do, that doesn't go through the cover. Okay. There is an HOA switch. HOA stands for hand off auto. Hand means I want to override all the safety features of the system and I want to turn the pump on. So hand means when I flip that switch, 
I'm turning the pump on. Now, here's the more important thing to remember. You are responsible for turning the pump on, so therefore you have to be responsible for turning the pump off. So H means I'm turning it on, O means I'm turning it back off. A means I'm going to put it in an automatic mode and I am going to allow the floats to turn the pump on and off. Okay, so that's your HOA switch. TNS. TNS is the same kind of switch. They call it a double throw switch. All right. Now what it means is if I switch it in one direction, it does one thing. When I switch it in the other direction, it does the other thing. So TNS, T means test. Test means that when I flip that switch, I'm putting electric to both the alarm horn and the light. And I should test to make sure that the horn and the light work. N means normal. I am now allowing the flow switch to determine whether or not those alarms have to work. S. S means that the alarm went off. I get to the job site. That is an 80 decibel horn. So loud I can hardly think. So what do I do? I flip the TNS switch to S and S means silence. Now, mind you, the alarm is still turned on and the light is still flashing, but at least I turned that horn off so now I can think about what I got to do to fix the problem. So that's your TNS switch, very important switch on there. Okay, there's your alarm horn. Remember, it's 80 decibels, very loud, and your beacon is up on top. There's a UL label in there, and there's also ratings in there. Okay, this is a duplex system. Remember, a duplex system is going to have an alternator in it, all right? You also have the opportunity to put two circuit breakers in here. Now, remember, you can have the disconnect switches outside the panel if you want, or you can put the circuit breakers right there if you want. It's up to you, all right? There will be two motor contactors, one contactor for one pump, one contactor for the other pump. Now, of course, that also means you have to have two HOA switches, one switch for each pump. You're going to have three terminal blocks now. One terminal block is for pump one. One terminal block is for pump two. The other terminal block is for the floats. You're going to have a float status indicator. You're going to have a control and alarm fuse. You're going to have a control on and off switch indicator. Uh, you're going to have a TNS switch. Now, there's only one TNS switch. Why is there only one TNS switch? Because you only have one alarm. You don't have to worry if there's two pumps. You still only have one alarm. All right? So there's your beacon and alarm horn. Over here is your UL label. You're going to find your wiring diagram and your schematic. There's your ratings. Okay? So that's a typical duplex. Now, I want to tell you that I said that was the typical duplex. You can put much more on there if you want to, both duplex and simplex. You can add a counter. A counter counts how many times that pump turns on. When you have a duplex system, having a counter in there is a good idea because now you know are the pumps alternating the way they're supposed to or is something being stuck? Is that alternator not working properly and one pump is working all the other all the time and the other pump isn't? Elapsed time meters can really be important to you. Uh, other things that you can put in there, you can put in a uh, phone dialer so that should, should the alarm float come on, it's going to send a signal to your phone saying, hey, we've got a problem here. So there's a lot of other stuff that you can add the key you have to remember is the more you put on there, the less standard it is, and so the longer it takes to make. All right? Now, let's look at fields for a little bit here. These drawings come out of the SSPMA. SSPMA stands for Sump Sewage Pump Manufacturers Association. It's an association that I kind of believe all pump companies that make sewage pumps anyway are going to belong to. All right. Now they have an affluent manual. This is the affluent manual. There's also a sewage and a sump manual. All right. 
This affluent manual design is designed to help you with affluent systems. So, what have we got here? From the house to the septic tank. Minimum grade is 1 inch and 8 feet. Maximum grade is 1 inch and 4 feet. Notice it also says I should be at least 10 feet away from the septic tank from the house. There should be that separation there. There's my septic tank. On the outlet of the septic tank, it's important to note that there is a minimum grade of 1 inch and 8 feet, but there is no maximum grade. Now, why is there a minimum maximum on the in inlet, but only a minimum on the outlet? And the reason is the inlet and it's going to have solids coming in, uh, minimum and maximum. Uh, on your inlet. On your outlet, because you're not worried about solids, you don't have to worry about that maximum. Okay? Those are called drop boxes. All right? You'll notice this particular system has two with a third possible. All right? A drop box has three holes in it. The first hole is that one in the top. That's the inlet where the water comes in. The second one that I'm pointing to there is your outlet, and, and that's basically a lateral. All right. The third one is going to allow you, actually it's the fourth hole, there's a, a lateral on each side. The fourth hole is going to allow you to go from that drop box to the next drop box. Now it's important to remember I don't want water backing up, so that last hole is between the two. When I make these drop boxes, that last hole is between the two. So when the water comes into the drop box, the lowest uh, holes are going to be those laterals and the water is going to go down the laterals. Now this is called a gravity feed system. Gravity feed system simply means that we're just using gravity and for every gallon of water that goes into the septic tank, a gallon of water comes out of the septic tank. The danger here is this. Gravity feed systems are designed to fail. Now, the reason that I say that is simply because of the fact that when you have a gravity feed system, the water goes into the drop box and then it goes out down that lateral. Every gallon in puts a gallon out, which means if that septic tank gets used regularly throughout the day, you're going to wind up with that first hole in that lateral always being wet the wet hole is what causes the bacteria to grow there and eventually plug the hole up. So of course what winds up happening is you start plugging those holes up, the ones closest to the drop box, and then as you get further and further away. Now of course once all the holes are filled up, then what happens? The water automatically goes down to the second drop box. It's designed to fail. Okay. Uh, you'll also notice over here it shows a sump pump. Now, I'm pointing that out for two reasons. One is you never want your sump pump that's collecting the water from around the house to pump into the septic tank. That's a no-no. Now, the reason it's a no-no is simply this. Clear water going into the septic tank does nothing more than push out good bacteria. So if you're dumping a lot of water in there that's clear water, you're just emptying out your good bacteria. All right? So we don't want sump pumps that are pumping water that's collected around the house going in there. That sump pump I'm allowing because if you'll notice, it appears as though it's drawing its water from something else. Maybe a washing machine something like that okay because there's something in there that's got an elbow uh, that's got a hook in there that uh, allows the air to uh, get out of the system there all right so that's what that sump pump there is for all right now here's another picture of a very similar system except that we have a pumping tank in here so now we've got a uh, this particular system all right, there's two different types of systems that, that are going to use a pump. One is called a low pipe pressure system. The other is called a pump and dump. A pump and dump 
is this system here. It's got drop boxes in it. A low pipe pressure system does not use drop boxes. It just fills the system up and pressurizes it. All right. A pump and dump fills the system up and lets gravity take over. So you don't want to pressurize that pump and dump system. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. All right. Uh, you can see it's quite deep. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, know your local codes. Know if they'll allow you to go that deep with it. Okay. So you got a septic tank, you got a pump chamber, you got three drop boxes. Okay. Pump and dump system. Low pipe pressure, same type of system. All right. You've got system A and system B. Those are two different systems. They're not the same system. We're not burying two different systems here. One means if I have to pump the water up. B means if I have to pump the water down. Okay. Low pipe pressure system simply means that we are going to actually uh, pressurize the system and force the water out of it. All right. Now, there's no drop box. There may be a manifold, but there's no drop box. On the end of the corners, you're going to find a pipe that elbows up and has a pipe plug on it. That is a testing pipe. So the inspector can test your system to make sure that it's doing what he wants it to do. He's going to tell you how many feet of head he expects to come up out of that system with those uh, pipes open. So he'll go around, he'll, he'll open up those systems, then he's going to go ahead and turn the fresh water on, turn the drain on, and uh, uh, run this system uh, once or twice. And as he does it, he's going to measure the amount of water coming up out of that pipe. If it's more than what he wants it to be, it means that you don't have enough holes in your system, you got to put more holes in which really isn't bad because the other side of that coin is you're not getting enough water coming out and that means you've got too many holes and now somehow you got to try and plug them. That's a lot more difficult. Okay. Notice over here, here's your pumping chamber and once again the pumping chamber has the piping come all the way up so I can pull that pump out of there without having to get my head down in that system. Okay. We've got a float tree in there so we're operating with floats and there's our high point okay now we want to talk about dosing for a little bit because there is the there is the um, system where it's gravity feed and then there is dosing systems dosing means I'm either pressurizing the system or it's a pump and dump but it's a dosing system okay two types of dosing system one is called time dosing now I mentioned earlier that we had that float tree in there this system here that you see is not using a float tree. This is using float weights. So it's going to attach the cord to the ceiling, and then they're going to put a weight on there above the float, maybe three or four inches. And that allows that float to have a tether of three to four inches. The weight is heavy enough that the float can't lift the weight up. So the float just moves in the on position. The bottom float is going to be the timer on float. Now, this is not the timer for the pump. This is the timer to time how long between doses. That's something that your inspector is going to tell you. Typically, he's going to say three or four doses a day. Three doses a day means one dose every eight hours. Four doses a day means one dose every 24 hours. Okay, so that turns that timer on there. Then there's the timer override float. We'll talk about that in a second. And then there's the alarm float. Okay, now what happens is this. You start filling the system up. The timer on, on the timer float there isn't up, so nothing's turning on. Nothing's happening. When the water get a, gets above that timer, the float turns in the on position and it starts the six or eight hour session that you have to wait based on the number of uh, doses you can do in a day. Again, your inspector is going to tell you how many that is. Now, once the system timer says, okay, it's time to turn the pump on, it turns the pump on. If the timer says, okay, we're going to turn the pump on, the pump comes on, and it pumps down, 
but there's still enough water in there to keep that timer float on, we start our next six or eight hours right away. If, however, it uh, goes on and drops below the uh, float, now it turns that timer off and you have to wait until the water gets back up high enough to turn that timer back on. Timer override. It's Super Bowl Sunday. The parties at my house were drinking lots of beer. Everybody knows you don't buy beer, you rent it. And so, of course, everybody's using the bathroom. And, of course, if they fill my system up before my six or eight hours are up, what's going to wind up happening? Well, my alarm float's going to go off, and then if I don't stop using the system, I'm going to fill the system up and the toilet's going to back up. So to prevent that from happening, the timer override says, I don't care if it's not time to turn the pump on, I'm turning it on anyway. And it turns the pump on, and it runs it for whatever time is allowed. Now, typically speaking, it's going to turn off and still be above the timer floats so the timer finishes its session and runs another cycle a little sooner okay and of course that last float is your alarm float and of course with the alarm float it means that well things got too high something's not working and we need help float dosing is the next type of dosing that we're going to talk about float dosing basically says now you'll notice once again we're using weighted floats here okay Float dosing says I've got an on float and I've got an off float. I have to determine how much water I need to get rid of and then how much area in my basin that, that takes up. And then I just go ahead and I space my two floats based on that area. Okay, And of course the alarm float is there just in case something happens. So with the on and off alarm floats, it's going to turn on when it gets high enough. It's going to turn off when it gets low enough. That's the key to remember there. And there's your alarm float. This is called an aerobic treatment system. You'll notice instead of having two chambers, there's three. The middle chamber is the aerobic treatment chamber. All right. Basically what happens here is you're coming in from the house into your septic tank and then you go from your septic tank into your air treatment chamber and there's an air pump actually pumping air in there and what happens now is I'm oxygenating that water and of course the oxygen is killing off the bad bacteria the good news is when the water moves over into my simplex pump chamber the BOD count is way down it might be 5 instead of 10 to 20 so that means that my system is going to last longer just because the fact that my BOD count is down. Our next system here, our next field rather here, is a uh, typical pump and dump system. With a low pipe pressure system, I'm going to use small pipe because I want to pressurize the system. All right. With a pump and dump system, I just want to get as much water out there as possible, so I'm going to use big pipe. So you'll notice here that I start out with six inches of number six gravel. I lay my piping down and then I make sure that I've got two inches of gravel above my piping. So there's a total of 12 inches of gravel there. Now the reason that we're using number six stone is because number six stone is pretty good size, which means that I'm going to have air spaces between those rocks. And that's what I want. I want, the, I want the water to come out, to seep out through the perforated pipes. I want it to seep down into the ground. And as it goes down in the ground, I want to go past all this oxygen so that oxygen can kill off the bad bacteria. Then I'm going to put some kind of straw or fabric filter over there so that, that way when I put my sandy loam on, it doesn't get down into the rocks. If the sandy loam goes down in the rocks and plugs everything up, did I accomplish anything? No. So I want to make sure that I keep that sandy loam from going down in there, and that's what the straw or fiber is for. Okay. Now we're going to give you a couple samples of systems here. This is a low pipe pressure system. All right. Remember, we're going to have a one inch pipe uh, as laterals. We'll probably have a two inch pipe as a, man, as a main line coming out to the system. 
When you get to the system, you can have what's called an end manifold. An end manifold means that I'm bringing my supply line to the end of the manifold. Then I'm going all the way down the manifold, and I'm going into each lateral from there. Then there is the center manifold. The center manifold means that now I'm going to have the manifold uh, with the uh, supply line in the center of it. Okay, now the water goes either way down the, the manifold and then down the laterals. The last one is the middle manifold. The middle manifold means I'm going to actually run the manifold down the middle of the field. And then I'm going to run laterals out from each, each of there then. Okay, is there one preference over the other? Not that I can think of. A couple other things before we leave this picture. You're going to notice there's your septic tank and your pump chamber right there. Okay, you'll notice there is what they call a repair field. A repair field. If you have room enough, I would put two fields out there and then a repair field. Now, the reason I'm saying that is I would connect both systems to my pump chamber. And once a year, I would go out there and I would say, okay, flip the switch so that we use this area instead of that area. And what that does, that gives the area that's not being used a whole year to dry up and clean up. So you get rid of all that bad bacteria. If you can't afford to do that, well, then you can't afford to do that, okay? Note where the well is. Note what your setback is. All right. In the picture here, the setback is 100 feet. Um, I actually had a house one time that we had to put a new septic system in, and the setback for that one was only 50 feet. So make sure that you know what your setback is and that you're following that setback. The system on top is a trenching system. The system on the bottom is a bed system. Some people prefer the bed system. Some people prefer the trenching system. Some people think the trenching system gives you more oxygen, whereas they feel the bed system fills up faster, and therefore uh, you don't get as, uh, the longevity out of it as you might otherwise get. And then I think this is our last slide. It talks about a gravity feed system. We come out of the house, we go into the septic tank. Remember, every gallon in pushes a gallon out. Every gallon out goes along that side. Of course, when one gets filled, then we move down to the next and the next. Okay. Here is our, our last system here. And, and again, when you look at this system, it's just like the other systems we saw. It's a gravity feed system. It's got drop boxes in it. This time, they actually show you the, the uh, washing machine so you know that that sump pump is connected to the washing machine. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Wash water does not belong out in the yard. When I first bought my house 24 years ago, um, I have two houses on the property. Uh, I built the second house uh, back in 2003. I bought the property that I live on though back in 1994 and that original house had a sump system that was dumping out by the road. The uh, inspector liked to drive along the roads because if he saw what I had, which was a big, flat, open area, in other words, no grass, no weeds, nothing grew there, he knew that because nothing was growing there, that I was dumping my uh, wash water into my septic or into my sump pit, okay? It belongs in the septic tank. It belongs in the septic tank. If you put it in the sump pit, the phosphates in that are going to kill everything, and that's why it belongs in the septic or in the septic tank, not in the sump pit, okay? So we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you very much.